What's up everyone? You want to know how to learn the powerful one-two punch on how to fill that pipeline and uh, close more sales when you're in luck? Because our guest today I'm excited about, Tony J. Hughes, we're going to bring on in a minute, is going to teach you how to do that. Uh, here's the book. Read this book. If you haven't picked it up, check it out. Uh, I was blown away when I read this book. I've read it over three times already. Uh, I wish I picked this book up a year and a half before I read it because I figured a lot of the stuff out on my own. It was a bitch, but this will put it in uh, in format for you. My name's John Sparocco. This is my co-host, Craig Lack. If you're new here, we teach independent healthcare advisors how to close more business with sales and marketing tricks. Bigger business. You, bigger business. The, the same. Um, today's show is sponsored by none other than Achieve Health Alliance. Stop loss, captives, pharmacy solutions, you already know. All right, so let's get into it here. Our guest, Tony J. Hughes, has been teaching sales for over 30 years. He's got personal team records that still uh, haven't been broken to this day. He's a best-selling author, number one ranked sales blogger, number three on LinkedIn, has over 300,000 followers. He once uh, wrote... I think 70, seven months straight, wrote a blog a day, and uh, unbelievable. Let's welcome to the show, Tony. How are you? Hey, John. Hey, Craig. Thanks for having me on the Heads Up Advisor uh, show. Thanks for coming on Thanks, here. Uh, so let me let me start by, uh, is this true that you used to be a pilot and uh, you survived the crash? I think I read <laughs> that or heard you say that before. Yeah, it's true. I've uh, had three engine failures and I survived one, uh, one, one crash. I lost my engine above a big pine forest, but I was uh, flying illegally high so that if anything happened, I had enough height to be able to glide out. So it was, it was good that I did that. <laughs> so were you, I mean, what was that like coming down? You're crazy. I mean, You're not stupid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, my, my flying instructor saved my life. Uh, when I went solo, I went solo in club record time. So I was young and cocky and had the skill, but he was very worried because they're the type of people that kill themselves, right? So he said to me, hey, before I let you go solo, what's the definition of confidence? I said, oh, I don't know. Co confidence is when skill and experience comes together. You can be confident. And he said, uh, no. Confidence is the feeling you have just before you understand the situation. And I've, I've carried that through my whole life in business. There's always something going on inside the customer organization with politics and projects and initiatives or, or competing for funding with desperate competitors thrashing around. You've got to be positively paranoid, not, uh, not confident and complacent. Got it. Got it. So let's, uh, let's go head first right into it then. I mean, you know, what's the, we're sales guys on here, insurance consultants. What's the number one problem? Why are, why is everybody's pipeline empty? Hmm. Well, the, well, the failure rates in B2B selling are climbing every single year. Uh, it's getting increasingly difficult to be successful. And yet the reality is it's never been easier. Um, so the tools and information and different channels available to us should be making it easier. And in my view, the reason people's pipelines are drying up is they've stopped using the phone. They've stopped time blocking daily activity to go and build quality sales pipeline. People have uh, bought into this false notion that if I just groom my LinkedIn profile and do a little bit of marketing, then the world will be to pass to my door. And it's just not true. Um, we need to target uh, the right buyer personas, that correct role. You know, and I would argue we've got to go and get to the person that has economic power in the decision making process. So rather than HR people, we need to get to the financial control of the CFO and we need to be able to have conversations with them that they regard as highly relevant. So we've got to target the right people in the ideal customer profile organization. So every uh, consultant, advisor, broker should uh, know what the ideal customer profile looks like. So that's industry size, the um, the sort of demographics of the organization. And then we need to know the different people we're going to sell to because most organizations won't change today until they achieve consensus inside their own organization around that change. Uh, it's especially difficult when they've got a sort of rusted on relationship with an incumbent supplier. So we've got to help them build the business case for change and get consensus for them to do it. So we're going to get back on the phone is the first thing, the right level of activities. We've got a time block. You know, I would say a minimum, a minimum of two hours every day to time blocking for driving quality sales pipeline. 
But here's the really important thing. Just getting busy but having the wrong sort of conversation narrative is just being a busy fool. We've got to have the right conversations. We've got to move away from talking about us and what we do and instead talk about them and their potential better results that they can actually be achieving. Uh, and then what we've got to do is also drive the right combinations of outreach. And the reason that's important, it's what really birthed the Combo Prospecting book, is uh, people have this bias or propensity to ignore anybody that they don't know or that they think is trying to sell them something. So, uh, you know, we all do it. The average person gets about 120 emails a day wow. and people just tend to get their mobile device and they just go down and skim. They just go down having a look. Is there anything here I need to respond to? I'll just ignore the rest. So we need yeah. to become the signal amidst the noise and find a way to break through with combinations of outreach. So, you know, interesting combo prospecting. You know, I, I remember when I read the book and and – it made sense to me because I thought of who's done that to me, right? And I thought of the great sales organizations like Ring Central. They hit me with it. And one or two others, maybe with Salesforce or somebody else. And I distinctly remember that person, right? You don't remember, guys, you don't remember when you receive one phone call or you receive one email. But when they hit you from every angle, all of a sudden you remember who they are. Who the hell is this? So. So let's talk about that for a second, because you've already mentioned it. You know, we, we, we joked last time, what's the number one sales tool? If you haven't figured it out already, Craig can hit you overhead because it's the telephone, right? Guys, people, people are being marketed to all day long. And, and Tony, you tell me, has the phone now become even more effective than it once was because of social selling? Absolutely bang on. And for everybody watching this, almost all of your competitors treat the phone like it's covered in spiders. You know, they just all have this aversion to being rejected. And the truth is just embrace the thing you fear the most and go and do what your competition's not. And a human conversation is the most powerful thing. And if you can develop a consultative narrative where you've got genuine insights, where you honestly believe whether they buy anything from me or not, even if they stayed with their current broker, if they got value out of the conversation with me, I'm not going to be ashamed about that. I should be charging them for consulting. So them giving me, you know, a few minutes on the phone now and then 20 minutes or 40 minutes later on face to face, they're going to get real value out of this. They're going to uh, become aware of opportunities to improve their business, whether we do business or not. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to be really um, uh, politely persistent, but I'm going to go hard at them. I want the person thinking, I may as well get back to this person because they're clearly not going to give up. And it seems like they've got a conversation that I could get something out of. Yeah, I think all of us out there, salespeople, all, all I, I know I do, remember the persistent salespeople. And at some point you say, shit, this guy's good, right? And yeah. what do they say? 3% of buyers are ready to buy today. So when you are ready to buy, guys, and I taught you this on marketing, consistently marketing, is you're going to think of that person that was banging the phone to you or sending you emails consistently. You're now going to give them an opportunity. So, Tony, talk to me about the combo prospecting approach because our viewers don't know what it is. Traditionally, uh, and I was probably a victim of doing this two years ago until I learned marketing, just going on rants on LinkedIn, they think that's marketing. They think sales... They think sales is marketing. So let's put it in a context for them. What should they be doing? Well, people have to find a way to break through to those they can help. Um, and because people have a bias to ignore one single piece of communication, what Combo is, is you nail your narrative. You make it all about them and their results, not about us and, what our, not about us and our attributes or us and what we do. And what you do is you call them. You leave a voicemail and the, all the voicemail says is, uh, hey, John, really looking forward to getting together with you for 20 minutes next week. Um, I've, I've sent you an email. Let me know what works best for you. And what that'll do is it'll drive them to the email. You don't try and give your pitch in a voicemail. So you phone, you leave a voicemail. Then what you do is you immediately send an email. And that's a basic triple. And you can execute a triple in 90 seconds. Um, you may want to add a text message. Certainly the next time you run a combo at them, I would add a text message. You add a LinkedIn in-mail. You maybe even add a LinkedIn connection request. Um, you know, you send them a fax. Uh, you type a letter uh, and get a courier to them. 
uh, you get a carrier pigeon to deliver a message. You just you just drive combinations of outreach where they think, holy hell, this person's determined they deserve a response. And so long as our narrative, our message, our talk track is about them and their response, uh, them and their results, not about us and our attributes, then we're not annoying. We're persistent, and they'll respond to us. Yeah, I, I love that that idea. When I read it, I thought it was brilliant because I right away thought of people who have done it to me. I think you mentioned yeah. facts. It's it's funny, right? So I think facts probably falls under snail mail and even the telephone because nobody's doing it anymore, and it and it stands out. You're like, I got a fax. I see a fax come in through through email fax. I go, who the hell's faxing me? Right. So yeah, you know that's an interesting way to reach out to these people. So I mean. Talk to me a little bit about, you know, how, how, so you gave us the combo approach and I think that works well, especially when you have targeted, you target your list. You talk about get 50 companies, multiple people at the organization, target them directly. But how do I start with maybe casting a wide net and, and finding interest in the marketplace? Where, where do I begin there? Okay, so there's an almost magical thing that's, uh, t timelessly true and it will it will never go away is being hyper effective for salespeople and that's a concept called trigger events so so what a trigger event is it's something that happens in the marketplace that creates opportunity for us but it also creates awareness and context for our conversation for the person we're wanting to get to so you know what's also true is that trigger events combined with referrals are the fastest path and the highest probability to revenue. I just want to give you um, an example of this in the real world. You imagine that you've built a great relationship with someone in, in an account that you've been looking after as a broker for a long time, and that person leaves that organization and goes somewhere else. That's a trigger event that's got a threefold domino effect. So you want to congratulate that person on their career change, and you want to follow them into the new organization. So that's in essence a trigger event and a referral into that new organization because this person trusts you. And if your basic narrative to them is, hey, I've just loved working with you over the last five years, um, would love to see how I could potentially help you get some early wins in your new role because every new person in a role wants to deliver some early wins for their boss to give their boss confidence in that hiring decision they made in bringing them in. So you go follow them into the organization there's a domino effect that the person that was your supporter that's left is going to be replaced by somebody, either promoted internally or coming in externally. And if they're coming in externally, we don't want our competitor that's had a relationship with them to do what you just did and follow them into your account. So you want to make sure that you congratulate that person on coming into the organization, not disingenuously, but then you go and, and get together with them to brief them and say you've got some ideas on how they can get some early wins in their role. Um, and then the, the other thing that happens is that person that's coming into your account, they came from somewhere else. So as you build that relationship, you ask them, hey, you know, I noticed in LinkedIn, you know, you were with this other organization. Um, would, would it make sense for me to contact them? You know, what's, what's going on inside that organization? Um, because the organizations I typically work with, I help them drive cost out of what's either their second biggest or third biggest expense line on the P&L. Um, who's the who's the financial controller or chief accountant or CFO at that organization? So that's the power of trigger events. And when you combine them with referrals, it's the fastest path and the highest probability to revenue. So if you're looking to create a sales pipeline, just making sure you connect. You get first degree connections with all of your network. There's a, a LinkedIn product called Sales Navigator. Yeah, go into that um, because because I don't even think yeah. I know it's I know what the trigger event is and, and just go into detail exactly how these guys can do it. Yeah. So, so what Sales Navigator does is it enables you to save your accounts and then the contacts, the people inside those accounts that you either have relationships with or you want to build relationships with because every broker, advisor, consultant should be seeking to elevate their relationships to get beyond the lower level HR people to get to people with true economic power like the financial control of the CFO. So you can save all those people as as uh, leads. So that it's a different terminology than what a CRM system would use, but Sales Navigator LinkedIn called this a lead against an account. And every time any of those people get promoted, leave, publish content, 
or the organization issues a press release on your financial results or they're you know they're basically it's also connected to um, uh, Google as well it'll alert you about changes in the accounts and it'll give you opportunities to engage and engage people so that you're never really making cold calls you're getting into their orbit um, because I'm not a big fan of making cold calls but I'm a massive advocate of getting back on the phone with people and it's not hard to warm things up and create some kind of context so a tool like Sales Navigator can make that really, really easy for you. You can also set up Google Alerts and Twitter is also a, a, an, another platform. So if you're thinking about trigger events, it's Google Alerts, it's Sales Navigator and it's Twitter are the three most powerful platforms out there that you can use. So Tony, would you say, we talk a lot about this in our group, you can invent a trigger event that's relevant to them. Yes. You, you've already copied and covered some of those. Uh, Google Alerts is a good one. Going to their website, you know, if you have your target audience of 10 companies, 50 or 100, you go onto their website and they're publishing news all the time. They're doing PRs and you can comment on that. Now, we're in healthcare for God's sake. So the trigger events never stop. Guys, gals, we could, you can write an article that says, hey, you know, the Cadillac tax never went away holy crap it's two years from now you can talk about the fifth circuit court the appeals court is meeting in july to potentially vacate the affordable care act what should they be concerned about what are they going to do next if the affordable care act gets repealed and and so you're literally or you could just do news hacking find a relevant article in their industry or that's topical about health care hey last week uh 88 New York Times, $88 billion were borrowed by American workers to pay health care expenses. That's a pretty big deal. And so you just yeah, Craig, I, things. Yeah. Yeah, Craig, I, I really love that. And, and a book everybody should read is a book by David Meerman Scott, and it's called The New Rules of Marketing and PR. And he talks about a lot of those things that you just covered, Craig. It's a really, really good book for people to read. Yeah, I think... Uh, Tony, what I noticed you do, and, and Craig was talking about it, talk about content curation for a minute, because people think, you know, salespeople, we suck at, at writing. Let's let's be honest. We're terrible writers. I know I am. I'm trying to study and get better. But what is talk about curating content and how we can take those articles and just consistently pump stuff out with little to no work and even hire somebody to do it, which they should be doing. Yeah, because, because pumping content about you and what you do uh, our market just see that as spam and they tend to turn off. But if we can pump out content uh, that's relevant to the customer in their world, then th what they'll see us as is a, is a content hub. You know, they'll be thinking in their own mind, I don't have time to go and look at all of these different places on the internet to stay current. But if I just follow Craig, he seems to find all of this great content for me. So, th so then they, they really value you when you eventually call them um, again, nothing is cold. So the art of content curation is every time you go meet with your clients, whether they're an HR or the CFO or, or other key people, ask them, you know, if you've got good relationships with people, you're buying them coffee or lunch or something, just say, you know, which consultants, journalists, um, you know, blogs, wh whereabouts do you look to for education in your role, you know, when it, when it comes to employee healthcare? Um, when you, whenever there's a, a, a big conference on, there'll be a bunch of speakers. Go and connect to all of those people. Subscribe to their blog. There's a concept called RSS feeds. So you can easily subscribe to a blog and then you get notified when they publish content. That's, that's also the, con the, the concept of following someone in Twitter is you get notified when they have content come up. So the idea is find those thought leaders, share their content, and just run a little bit of pragmatic commentary. So you might say... You know, really interesting little article. Little about copy, little things. copy above rub the post, basically, right? Yeah, exactly. So you just cut and paste the link, and then you just say, "Really interesting article about X, Y, Z." Um, I, th I think Mike's comments on ABC are bang on the money. What do you think, right? And then, then you just post that. So you want to try and create some kind of engagement where people go, "Wow, this guy is finding really interesting content that's relevant to me." I think uh, I'll, I'll touch, I'll add to that because it's something new that uh, Craig's son ha has taught me, a Facebook guru, is, is there's, a, there's a program called Snipply. I don't know if you're aware of it. So yes, what you do is, is you just, you take, you take that uh, link, right? You put it in Snipply. So when people, you post that online, people leave that link. You can actually install a Facebook pixel to pixel that person that's reading your audience with your ads later. 
And you can have a pop-up, which you'll start to see from us, that says, hey, join Heads Up Advisor Group, or you can put, hey, book a call, or check out Tony's blog, so on and so forth. Have you used that at all? Yeah, so, so pixel tracking is incredibly powerful. Um, what, what I tend to do for myself is I use content curation tools. So um, I use a tool called Social B that's publishing uh, dozens of pieces of content every day. I've got over 500 articles I've written, so I, I recirculate those over, over a 12, 18-month period. But there's content curation tools. There's pixel tracking tools. It's the same for emails. There's tools that will help you um, send emails at, you know, during the golden hour of sending an email rather than at times where people ignore it. So there's tons of technology. And the thing that's important for everybody watching this today is that selling is very much a human thing, but we've got to become like Iron Man. You know, it's it's man and machine working together that that uh, that needs to happen in order to be successful. So unless you work out how do I automate and leverage technology and tools combined with my human conversations and insights, that's what it takes to be successful today to get the level of, of productivity and effectiveness that we all need. Yeah, it was interesting because as we're, as we're bringing you on the show the past week or so, I've been watching you closely and I'm like, God damn, this guy posts eight, ten times a day. And I know it's not you doing it, but I didn't realize how many times a day you are posting. So I assume you're using that tool to just say, hey, here's a bunch of articles I like, throw them in there, post them throughout the week. Is that what you're doing? Yeah, so, so for example, if I, if I come across a great article, I'll just go cut paste into my content curation tool. Again, I use this tool called Social B. I'll add some commentary, you know, um, brilliant video on the three most important things in sales qualification by, you know, this person. Um, I'll put in some some Twitter hashtags in it and I'll just put it in the tool and then the tool schedules it. Because what a lot of people do is they do a whole bunch of activity. They sort of swamp their feed with with activity for a sort of 40 minutes, then they do nothing for seven days. What you want is a, is a good cadence where content's coming out at times people are most likely to see it drift across their feed in LinkedIn or Facebook. So you're, so are there any other tools that you want to mention? I know there's one uh, that you, you shared a ton in the book and we'll make everybody uh, go purchase the book, but I know there were some other tools that you had in there that literally can, can, can scour the internet and find that person's email and phone number of the prospect that's on LinkedIn. Yeah, so, so the number one tool that recruitment consultants use for sourcing people's direct contact details is a, a tool called Lusha, L-U-S-H-A. People often say Lusha, but it's Lusha. Um, uh, and it ethically uh, sources publicly available data and it'll publish it against someone's LinkedIn profile. So it's a Chrome plugin. Um, there's things like Reportive, which is a reverse uh, lookup engine for email addresses. You can just try the different things and go, yes, that, that, that's the right email address for this person. So it's never been easier for us with all the sales intelligence tools out there. Um, but when it comes to tech, everyone needs a smartphone. Um, everyone needs a CRM system so you can have some, some discipline uh, in being able to follow people up well. Uh, and they all need, in my view, uh, absolutely LinkedIn, but probably Sales Navigator, so you can monitor for trigger events. Yeah, can you talk about, because we're, we're independent healthcare advisors, smaller firms, can you talk about the, these corporate companies like the Ring Central, Zooms, and all these big guys, that I think they call them SDRs, where it's, they hire somebody full-time to do this, to make the calls, to do emails, and, and tee them up for the, for the closer. Yeah, um, and that that model's okay. Um, it was it was pioneered by Salesforce in around two thousand, and there was a book written by um, Aaron Ross. Um, it was actually co he he he, he co-authored it with uh, Mary Lou Tyler, who I know really well, and the book was called Predictable Revenue. That model is good, but there's a problem with it. If you want to call into the owner of a, a corporation business, the CFO, someone really senior. The person making that call is, you know, must be able to carry the conversation. So my view is everyone needs to be their own SDR. You know, sitting back, waiting for leads to come in, hoping your website's going to do it, publishing a bit of content and hoping that will do it just isn't enough. So we need to be our own SDR. So these bigger organizations separate the function. They'll have inbound SDRs, sales development reps, outbound sales development reps, and then they'll stratify the sales organization all the way through to the big field enterprise salespeople. But... You know, probably for us on the call, we just need to be our own SDR. So we need to think, 
have a CRM, identify the key people in an organization, get their contact details, and then time block, you know, at least two hours a day where you're on the phone driving combos, phone, voicemail, email, text message, right, is, you know, is really kind of the minimum, you know, run, run three or four, or either a triple or a quad at people do it all in 90 seconds, but don't leave the office the day before until you've got 30 to 50 people that you're going to call the next morning. It's honestly what it takes to be successful. Um, the whole notion that you can be successful without doing daily prospecting activity is complete lunacy. Yeah, I think that the, the salespeople, we've just fall in, fell into a world of is the, you know, uh, phone fear is what my telemarketer used to call. I had an ex ex Wall Street guy calling for me, and he used to talk about it. Just, you're just afraid of the phone. You're afraid to pick up the phone. And and the longer you go from not cold calling, the harder it gets every time. And you keep making excuses up for yourself. I think. And and you've talked about it in your talks. Is is you know people just don't want to get on the phone anymore. Hey Tony, I hear you talking about you know there's the old algorithm that people are still stuck in. And there's a new algorithm, and you got to use a combination of old school and new school and tech and social. So yeah. tell tell me about you know who are the sellers in our in our field in our vertical? Who are the sellers who are at risk of going out of business? Yeah, it's really interesting. There's a bunch of research done by by Forrester about the um, buying habits of corporations and enterprises, and uh, the impact that was going to have on salespeople. And basically what they believe is 22% uh, of B2B salespeople are in the process of disappearing. Where the roles are most at risk are those who just help a customer transact. So if all we're doing is help them transact what the customer perceives to be a commodity, we're in deep trouble. About a third of those roles are going away. Um, if all we do is have a relationship with people, that's really not enough value. The reality is for customers is they don't really see much value in a relationship. They just see it as a thing that consumes their time. Um, so, you know, the, the paradox is that we can't be successful unless we build relationships of trust with people. But for someone we want to get to that doesn't know us yet, not one of those people is lonely and bored and looking for a new friend in business, right? They're busy, they're stressed, right. they want to get home to their family. They want greater value from fewer relationships in their business. They don't want more and more salespeople coming to see them. So relationship on its own, about 15% of those roles are disappearing. Um, but this is what's really interesting. There's, there's a growth in roles for those that can be consultative. So that concept of a, a trusted advisor, a consultant that has a point of view about how a customer can improve their business, those people will prosper and continue to do well. But anybody who runs around the marketplace talking about them and their products and what they do is in is in massive, massive trouble. Yeah, it's funny you, you mention that because we talk about it all the time. All is the, the, time. The, the rise of, grab the Trojan horse, the rise of the consulting <laughs> role is, you know, and this is the award, the Trojan horse award we send out to people. We're going to have another one going out. Shout out to, uh, real quick, Allison DePauli is going to be getting an award, Trojan horse award, picking up a new account. We'll talk about it on the next show. But, um you know, it's that role of actually providing expert objective advice, not just being a transactional. Because, Tony, this, this industry was built on relationships, okay? Yeah. And building a relationship and trying to be people's friend. I'm newer in the industry, and, you know, compared to most of the age, I'm 35. Most people are 58. It's the average age in this industry. So it's, you know, I competed with guys that were doing it like Craig for 20, 30 years. And it's like, how the hell am I going to break this relationship and I realized I had to understand on how to lower healthcare costs, and that's what I did. Yeah. And I don't want to be people's friend either. I have customers that I like, but they want the expert. Am I right? Do they? They don't have time for this anymore to go out for golf. It's a demanding world. It's not like it once was. Do you want to talk about that? I mean, what it, what is the buyer's mindset now in that C-suite that you're around? Who are they looking yeah. for? Well, in 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 the again. We need relationships. We do. Relationships are important. But if we're trying to get to someone brand new, they don't want another relationship in their life from someone trying to sell them something. So in their mind, what what do I get out of this conversation? So we need to and look, I'm not from within your industry, right? So I may get this wrong, but but we need to call them and say, hey, hey, Mike, I, I work with CFOs in your industry and I've got some ideas on how you could drive 2% of cost out of what's probably the second biggest line item on your P&L. 
but do it in a way where you actually improve employee satisfaction, engagement and retention. When can we find 20 minutes next week? Right. And, and stop talking. And that, and that's the conversation. It's all about them and their potential results. And, and the way, the way I would feel if I was a, was an advisor, a consultant broker is if, is if they don't want to lean into that and have the conversation, they're asleep at the wheel and deserve to get fired in their role. I'm not going to say that to them, but that's how I feel because who doesn't want to improve results on something that's the second or third biggest expense item on their P&L? Like they'll say, how do you think you can do that? Well, well, that's what I want to talk about. So how's, how's, how's your calendar, right? And, and you've got to go and maybe, maybe, um, a a um, one level deeper, you know, to actually get the meeting. Yeah. Um, but but that's what it takes. Saying, hey, you know, uh, I want to be your friend. Can you kind of buy you a coffee so you can educate me about your business? I know we never say it that way, but that's what they hear. They think I'm not interested in educating a seller about my business. What do you think you can do for me? And we've got to talk about business results. We need to talk the language of leaders, and the language of leaders is delivering outcomes and managing risk. And the only outcomes that matter are outcomes that can monetize in terms of dollars or percentages or speak to a key result area in their business. So, Tony, you could sell in our business right now just based on what you said, which sounds an awful lot like the shit we've been trying to teach these guys. Uh, wow. Focus on the results <laughs> and the outcomes. Never mention the H word. See, he could have got appointments and he never mentioned healthcare. Yeah, I, I, it's funny. Yeah. Because, it's funny, Tony, because my te- my telemarketer was marketing telemarketing for years. He didn't know a damn thing about healthcare, and you know, it's it's like you said. And people ask me, "What's the script, John? What should I be saying?" And, and I always say, "It's not always about what you say; it's how you say it." And keeping it short yeah. and sweet, you're selling the sizzle, not the steak, guys. There was situations that people would ask him questions and guess what? Those are calls that I would take later and say, hey, let's call this guy later. He needs more. And I've gotten some of my biggest accounts that way where he warmed up the call and now I'm calling him later. But again, it's, it, it, what is what should they be saying? I mean, you just said it, but can you just kind of just cover a little bit so they understand the fact that it's not so much detail about the call when you get these people on the phone? Yeah, well, one, one of the laws of selling that works normally against us, actually, is that we get delegated down to who it sounds like we deserve to speak with. So if you talk about lower order issues, if you talk about healthcare to the CFO, who think, oh, there's someone in HR that looks after the healthcare stuff, or there's someone in HR that looks after employee benefits, and they'll just try and push you off there. And 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 the reality is, is you need to start high in an account and you need to anchor value and you need to get sponsored down not delegated down so you've got access to come back right so and that's why you need to talk their language the cfo cares about improving the bottom line um and for example if there's high staff turnover that's got huge costs associated with it it can also impact revenue if they're customer facing people um you know as well as the direct uh costs associated with healthcare insurance so you just you make the conversation about their outcome, and you'd be ready to go one level deeper without without making yourself get delegated down and away to somebody else. So just saying, and by the way, the term I've got some ideas. Everyone's interested in some ideas. They're not interested in your sales pitch, but you know, hey, hey, Craig, I've got some ideas on how you. You don't say how we, right? So you make it about them, not you. They're the hero of the story, not us. I've got some ideas on how you could drive. And if you can give it a specific number that you can back up and prove, I don't know what your numbers are, but how you can drive two to three percent cost reduction in what's typically the second or third biggest line item on your PL, but in a way where you actually improve staff engagement uh, and 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 reduce um, staff recruiting costs by by reducing staff churn. When can we get forty minutes or twenty minutes? Um, they're going to want to know how. But they'll absolutely want to know how. And, and and again, it's those ones that don't know how, that don't aren't interested. It's just next. Am I right? Next. There's just more, you know, because I think we as consultants and brokers, we get, and, and Tony, the numbers are, and, and typically I tell them not to say this, we can save 20, 40% on healthcare because that's what everybody says. You sound like a guy go commercial, guys. I mean, come on. It's what it yeah. sounds like. I mean, it's big numbers, and Craig's great at putting it into aspects of what the CFO wants to hear it as. But I think... Today, hey, today I had a call. I had a call with a CFO. She says, hey, 
She had already told me the agenda. She said I got negative operating leverage, uh, and my direct report is putting pressure on me to show results in the second half of this year. Great. Here's the solution. Presented it. Executive team says I like it. The obstructionist in the room created red herring objections, <laughs> otherwise known as HR. And so yes. I was having a conversation <laughs> today with the CFO, and I said, well, what's changed in your objective? Do you still have negative operating leverage, and do you still need to show some financial results in the second half of the year? He said, well, then great. It's very simple. I went through why those objections were just red herrings, always sponsored by a non p &L manager who's only concerned about operations and process level crap. And I said, that's right. So if that's not changed, then the only question you have to answer is, will the C-suite force execution on the admin people because they have no p &L responsibility? Yeah, that's we, right. You've, you've got to deal got with the people grade. that own the p &L. Yeah, 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 yeah so, absolutely. So, so let me ask you, because this is a question that we always get is, is when is the best hour to call? What is the golden hour of selling? Uh, I think it was posting. So, <laughs> Posting articles. <laughs> well, no, it's both. Well, let me talk about it all. So, so th the best time to be on the phone is from seven forty-five in the morning to sort of ten to nine in the morning. So there's a there's a golden hour because all senior people, all senior people, get into work early so they can get their work done before their day turns to hell, with people standing at their door and being dragged away endlessly into meetings. Um, so that hour is ideal and if they're driving in their uh, car they're they're happy to have a conversation you know most people are happy you know leaders are happy to d deal with things during dead time in the motor vehicle they're not driving along listening to classical music trying to de-stress they're often on the phone calling their own people and trying to be productive now can they take um, those calls even if they drive on the wrong side of the road <laughs> I just... yeah we can <laughs> yeah, okay. we can. So, right. so long as it's on hands free, right? So, and then, and then the next best time is is typically after about four p.m. in the afternoon up until six p.m. So, my personal view is after six p.m. It's arguable that's people's family time, personal time. Uh, but between four and six p.m. again, 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 they'll be traveling. And the thing is, if they don't answer the phone, it doesn't matter. They'll 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 see the the, the phone ring. I think I don't know this person. They're, they're, they're not in my phone book. I'll dump the call. I'll let it go to voicemail. They'll then they'll then hear ding, and there's a voicemail message. They'll be playing that back. They'll be ding. Oh, they've also sent me an email. And I think, wow, this person's determined. They deserve a response. If you just do one thing, it just gets ignored. Um, and if the narrative is about, I've got some ideas on how you could drive these kinds of results, when can we find 20 minutes, 40 minutes? And I always use the language, when can we find? Because you don't want to be needy. You know, would it be possible? Is it okay? Do you have any spare time? No one has any spare time. They're all busy. But the way you need to feel is I'm busy. You're busy. This is important. Let's find some time. It speaks to a to a big line item on your P&L. And you can be driving much better results. So that really, really is the key. And every seller needs to recognize that the finite resource that they're really battling with is time, not the number of prospects. So what you want to get is you want to get a fast no. And, and a no is never a no, it's just a no, not now. Because maybe it's no, not now because they're happy with their relationship or they've got other fish to fry, you know, with their own priorities. They've got some other big burning platform going on inside their business that they're focused on. So, you know, then it's timing. And that's why if you're publishing insightful content in LinkedIn, you can keep them swimming around the boat. You can you can keep them in your orbit so you can have another another go at them in four months time. Yeah, Tony, here's a quick question. So uh, if for the average person in our group, let's say they had a twenty five thousand annual revenue uh, customer as their prospect, they're going to keep them an average of six years, six times twenty five is one hundred fifty thousand dollar lifetime value. How long do you think is reasonable to keep a prospect like that in your pipeline if they really fit your target market and they're worth 150 grand to you as a lifetime value of a customer? Um, if, if, if they fit your ideal customer profile in your target market uh, and the prize is worth the effort, um, I would keep them in my in my um, nurture pipeline forever. You know, it's why we all need a decent CRM. So we're, we're able to nurture with content marketing. So, you know, the idea is we have a blend of content marketing to lead nurture, stay in their orbit, and LinkedIn's an ideal platform for this, but then we drive direct outbound to people based on trigger events. 
So if something changes, you know, they they just made an acquisition, they just opened a new office, they just announced record results, um, their industry's got some new um, legislative requirement that's going to make it tougher for them. They, they, the customer, are facing increased competition that's causing them to want to have a look at their P&L and, and how can they run the business more efficiently. You're just constantly looking for trigger events that give you context. You say, hey, hey, Craig, I, I noticed this in your business recently. I've got some ideas on how you could, you know, when can we find 20 minutes? If, if you're always about them and their outcomes and the conversations are relevant to them and have context, you're not cold calling anybody. And I think people respect your persistence. Tony, let me let me ask you, you know, so we're, we're talking about they have to fire this this incumbent broker in order to get their business. What is yeah. the truth about why customers stay and, and, and why they engage with you and leave their existing broker? So the, so the reason that people will stay is because of emotional connection to a person or people, um, a, a brand or an experience that they get. So for me, I'm very loyal to my bank. And it's not because I've got any relationship with the person there that I care about. And it's not because I care about their brand. They just give me an awesome experience with all of my online banking, with apps and the internet. So they make it so easy for me. I love the process. So they'll stay because they've got emotional connection to one of those three things. The reason people leave, obviously, is they don't have that emotional connection. So again, you want to monitor. Here's a, here's a mind-bending trigger event you can use in Sales Navigator. Go and set up all of your competitor brokers as accounts in Navigator and their people as um, prospects uh, or leads, sorry, against the accounts. Whenever a a rep or a a contact from your competitor leaves, that's the time to contact their customer base because the umbilical cord's being cut about the emotional relationship. So monitor what your competitor's doing. When they leave or there's role or there's role changes, that creates an opening to go talk to a customer. So the reason people will leave is there's not the emotional connection, but here's the big reason they leave. They leave because they don't believe that you're part of them improving their results. And interestingly, in big enterprise selling, they found the number one reason why one company will win over all of the competitors. It's because the customer believed that they best understood them and that they were best positioned to help them deliver the business case for change. And that's your focus. You're just thinking, what would be the business case for change? I accept they've probably got a good relationship with somebody, but what's the business case for change? So you're so you're talking about is 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 pick, painting the picture for the future. It is a change, but I have the future at hand for you, and I know how to take you there. I've taken my clients there. Is that kind of the narrative you're building for them? Yeah, exactly. And again, I don't know your industry, but you know, if I if 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 I was in a an advisor consultant, I would create this double-edged sword narrative that that there's an opportunity for you, the customer, to not only reduce costs in an area, but in a way that actually improves staff engagement and productivity. Right? Like and you and you create a and you create all the evidence around all of this, but but you make it a double-edged thing. Because the the client's probably thinking, well, this is just all about cost. Well, yes, cost is important and there's a, an opportunity to better contain costs and reduce costs. But you can do it in a way where you actually get better engaged, more loyal employees, where you become an employer of choice, um, where you reduce your own staff turnover, you improve productivity inside the business. You know, happy uh, employees that are not financially stressed, that don't worry, are, are more productive employees. They have less sick days. They work harder. Um, the degree to which the employee believes that you, the employer, are all about them and their success in their own life is the degree to which they'll feel loyal to you. It's not the pay packet that they get. So if you just create a point of view, you know, as as an advisor consultant that's double-edged, you know, it's not just about cost. Like absolutely there's an opportunity to better control costs on this big line item on your PL, but in a way that achieves these other outcomes. Some of the clients I'm working with have been able to achieve XYZ. So if you've got the real examples for them, people lean in and they become curious about it. And people go, you know what? You're the person I want to work with. This other broker we've had for years, all they do is contact me 60, 90 days when our whole thing's due for renewal, and yep. they just make it a conversation about price. You know, yeah. you've got a point of view that can help me improve my business. And guys and gals, everybody listening. He just gave you a summation on how you build consensus at the same time you're prospecting because the outcomes and results he spoke to 
across the spectrum from finance to total rewards to a, a human resources, human capital. He crossed the, all sorts of borders there. So if you have discovered and discerned insights into this company, this organization, the industry, then when you speak to give them confidence, certainty, and consensus, you can touch on all these different things so subtly and so nuanced they, they will just think that you completely understand their business. And that is the whole game, isn't it, Tony? It absolutely is. You nailed it. Yeah, and I it's think. interesting. We didn't yeah, we, we didn't collude before this call, right? But we're on the same. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We're we, on we, the same we didn't page. give you that much information. I'll give you guys an example to put it in perspective. Met with a restaurant. And, you know, you know the industry, high turnover. But they have a, a, a department like the cooks and uh, managers that they want to retain and use benefits to retain them. So the first thing I asked them was, what's the cost of turnover here? Right? How much does it cost to turn these positions over that you're looking to retain? And what is the main competitor in the area? What are they doing? And and so let's talk about that. If I'm able to, you know, drop, and I think the turnover rate, r restaurants over 100%, but this position was somewhere around still high, was, I think it was like 70%. I said, if I could break, if I can cut that in half, what is that worth to you in a year? Right. So those are some of the things and the ways to position it. Like Craig would say is I'm not talking about health care. I'm talking about what's important to them. Yeah, we're going to save them 10, 20 percent. But I don't want to sound like a Geico commercial. Let's put on top the cost of turnover and retention of these people and then compound it with the savings from the healthcare standpoint, or maybe I even want to enrich the benefits because spending a little bit more money on healthcare reduces turnover, which in essence drives it to the bottom line. So with that, let me take a, a question that I have here. And it's, I know it's one that I always had and it comes up and I haven't done a training on it, but I, I, I really, Tony, I was going to steal so much stuff from your book and do tons of shows. And, and, and I said, you know what, if I can get Tony on, this is going to be even better. But how, how does one go about developing a list of prospects? Is there is there a specific way or, or something that they could use, like a tool to do that? Um, the thing I would typically use is Sales Navigator. So uh, in Sales Navigator, you can search based on geography, number of employees, keywords for roles. Um, and obviously it's easy to sell when you can reference other relevant organizations to the people you're targeting. But the thing is, we see what we're looking for. You know, I, I do uh, um, a lot of work with one of the global leaders in, in the travel industry, which boy, is that a commoditized space, right? Doing, doing travel management. Um, but the thing they found is when they started to really think about, about trigger events, um, we see what we're looking for so it's really a case of asking for referrals. Every single time you come across a happy customer, they say anything positive to you, you thank them and say, hey, who else do you know out there in the marketplace in your role that's been struggling with the same things? You don't say, can I have a referral? Because <laughs> that mm -hmm. turns people off. But just who else do you know that's struggling with the same issues, um, you know, that I, that I could potentially help? Um, and then, and you don't ask them to write you an introduction email because they never really do it. Again, you just get into it and just say, hey, would you just mind if, if I mentioned that you're a client, if I contacted them? And they go, yeah, you know, that's fine. Again, you can jump into Navigator. You can find the people. You can find the others in the organization that would be part of Consensus for Change. And then you can go at all of those people concurrently and you, you can name drop, you know, the thing to actually warm the call up. So um, I, I just think it's a case of leverage referrals, use something like Sales Navigator and sell into verticals where you've got traction. Because although what we do is pretty horizontal, you know, it applies across all industries. As you said, when you cited the restaurant business, there's nuances about individual businesses that will have a slightly different business case. And in every conversation, just say, hey, I'm just trying to understand what the business case would look like for you and potentially changing. Um, you know, and, and then you'd ask that question, what's your employee turnover? And say, oh, well, why do you need to know? Well, if it's if if it's high, there's probably the opportunity to actually save a lot of money by reducing staff churn. If you don't have a staff churn issue, then there's no point going there. But if you just have those questions that, that lead to value, that start to uncover where the business case is, just constantly think, what would the business case look like for the customer in changing advisor or broker? Well, great. Uh, as we wrap up here, I want to I want to ask you one question to touch on and final question to touch on. And you did a little bit earlier. And, you know, I I realize this 
meeting Craig and even my one of my good friends on here, uh, Steve, had had taught me a long time ago is is uh, build your personal brand. And I, and I would say, I said to him years ago, and I didn't listen. It was probably five six years ago when I started my company, and he said. Oh, just brand yourself. And I said, no, that doesn't work. That's not what the big guys do. They have their brand. They don't They don't brand themselves. And it was stupid of me to do that. And now I've come to realize, me and what Craig is, is you've got to brand yourself as the expert. You'll never be IBM or the big guy. So how important in the digital age is it to have articles out, authority things, that you've done and accomplished because the buyers have changed and the buyers are starting to look like me, not like Craig anymore, and they buy differently. What are you saying? <laughs> what are you trying, are you trying to say something? <laughs> so guys, just, just to support what you're saying, um, I decided to get serious about my own brand uh, four years ago, um, and I'm currently 57. So I think a lot of the people in this industry are older, um, like like me. More experienced. Um, Old dogs, old dogs that that can learn new tricks can deliver amazing results, right? So it's all a mindset. But here's why it's so important: when you run outreach to potential new clients, any of them thinking about responding to you, three quarters of the time they will have a look at your LinkedIn profile as part of deciding whether they'll engage or not. So seventy-five percent of people research before choosing to engage. And that's why you need a LinkedIn profile that's not an online CV, it's not your resume, it's a personally branded microsite, it's your personal website, where you talk about the results that you help organizations achieve and you start to show the insights that you've got as a, as a consultative person. And that's, and that's where you'd write some articles, right? So you'd, you'd write an article about the, the, the three areas to achieve these better results or the five risks that can be managed or, you know, whatever they are, but you really start to educate people, um, connect your brand to other people that they respect. That's part of finding those people that speak at industry conferences and uh, analysts, consultants, authors, go ahead and get connected, share their content. It's so important. So, um, social selling is not about narcissistically blasting and spamming people. It's about showing insights, providing value for people in advance of them ever deriving value from becoming your client. Sounds a lot like heads up advisor, what we're doing here, right? Would you say? Yeah. Well, it works. <laughs> hey, in the words it's worked of for you. Reagan. It's worked for me. In the words of Ronald Reagan, <laughs> I, I'm not going to make John's age an issue here and obviously point out that his youth and inexperience should be involved in selecting who your consultant should be. But Exactly, exactly. Well, listen, Tony, sit tight. But as we wrap up here, guys, make sure you go pick up the book Combo Prospecting. Help me change my mindset and understand it. There's tips, strategies to actually put it better in context because this is only one hour here and just kind of lay it out for you so you can start changing the way you're attacking your prospects. Great book. Pick it up. Go on LinkedIn. Make sure you add Tony and follow him. His content's outstanding from a sales perspective. Tony, thanks again for being on the show. Thanks, we really Tony. appreciate it. Thanks, John. Thanks, Craig. Really appreciate the invitation. All right, guys. We'll take soon. care. Good seeing you. See you on the next show.